All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And for the AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies class, evidently yesterday, when I did the last lecture, I forgot to turn on the recorder. So I've re-recorded the end of the Chapter 2 lecture and made it its own lecture. And now I'm going to go into Chapter 3. All right, it says in this chapter you'll learn how to code the HTML elements that you'll use most of the time. Then in the next three chapters, so in chapters four, five, and six, we'll, we'll talk about how to use CSS. All right, so we've already talked about a lot of this stuff, but we're going to continue to do so. All right, so we're going to talk, we, we looked at the title a little bit, but we'll look at the favicon and metadata. Then we'll go in with text elements, and we've, we've looked at a bunch of this stuff, but we'll look at it in a little bit more depth and breadth of coverage. All right, then we'll go into how to structure the content of a page, and finally talk about how to code links, lists, and images. Now, at the end of each one of these chapters, the authors give you a complete web page or website, and there's the one that they create. Now, there's really not much CSS in this, but they give you all of the HTML that they're going to use it here, all right? And the whole thing is really there on one page. So if you're struggling at all in this class, I would strongly recommend that you take a look at what's in there and hopefully it'll give you some help. All right, so let's just start from the top. We've talked about the title element already, okay? And the title element is actually used for a little bit more, I guess, than what I mentioned in class says it should follow SEO guidelines, but a couple things. First of all, notice ours says puppies. Well, how, where did we get that from? You may or may not remember this. So let's go back and take a look. And that's from right here. Okay. Now, usually, usually when, when you um, put a title in like this, people do it in different ways. I like to put in the name of the website, which is puppies, followed by a bar a space and a bar, and then that page. So if I had a contact page, this would become puppies, bar, contact, etc. Now you don't have to do it that way. Some people just put home there. Some people put something arbitrary there. I don't think that's a good idea. All right. Favicons. We had a little trouble with this yesterday, so I'm hoping we're going to be able to fix it today. So we'll see. What I'm going to try to do, though, because I've already created the favicon, is I'm going to attempt to remove it and recreate it. So there it is right there. This is what it looks like right now. Very hard to see. If I make it bigger, it is the picture of that puppy. You can see that. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that favicon and just call it old.ico. So I can go in and create a new one. And I want that one there just in case I have any trouble. All right, so I'm going to go out to the internet and I'm going to put in here free online favicon generator. Tried that one yesterday and I had some problems with it. So I chose this one, www.favicon-generator.org. All right, and it said choose your file. So I went over here and the file I want is actually in my images and it's that puppy. All right, now one thing I can do if I want to, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to open up the file first. I didn't do this yesterday, but I'm going to open it up and paint. It doesn't look like there's any white space or anything around there. It actually looks like it's of a decent size right now. All right, so that's fine. I'm going to keep it like that. All right, so this is the one I want, puppy.jpg. So I open it. There it is. And I click Create Favicon. But before I do, by default, it tries to create a whole bunch of favicons for me. Generate them for the web, which is good. Android, Microsoft, iOS, etc. Well, what I suggested yesterday is just use the one that's the 16 by 16 favicon. All right, so create favicon and it does it. Okay, and it says here upload the image and convert it, etc. Let's see, no file chosen. I thought I chose one. Maybe I didn't choose it. Open puppy.jpg, 16 by 16, create favicon. There it is. Now, before I download it, I want you to see this. They tell you how to use it here. I should have done this yesterday, and I didn't. So I'm going to grab that code that they show in here. Before I even download the favicon, I'm going to grab that code. 
I'm going to go back to my program and where I put it in yesterday, I'm going to replace that with those two lines. That would have been a much cleaner way of doing it yesterday. There. All right, I don't know why you need the two lines. I typically have done it as one, but it looks pretty much like it's almost the same thing twice. There are differences. So now I'm going to click Download the Generated Favicon. There it is. Now it's called Favicon 1 because I already had one. This does not have an app associated with it. Well, let's go in. So on mine, of course, it goes into my downloads folder. <clears throat> there it is, and it's Fabicon 1. So I'm going to just grab it, right mouse click, choose copy. So I've still got a copy of it if I do want it for some reason. Go over to my website 2, wherever that is, there it is, and drop it right here. So paste. And there's Favicon. Now I want to change the name because I'm referring to it as Favicon, not Favicon 1. So I'm going to remove all that. Then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to open it with paint. Why? I just want to show you this. I'm going to click resize. And when I click resize and if I click pixels, notice it's 16 by 16. I'm going to double that. So I'm going to put a 32 here and that changed to 32. And I'm going to click OK. Okay, in fact, I'm going to double it again so it's easier for me to work with. I can knock it down again if I want to. So 64 by 64. And you'll notice there's a lot of white space right there. So I'm going to remove that white space. We'll talk about how to do this in class. It's no biggie. So I'm going to save it. And one more time, whoops. This is where I ran into problems yesterday. It's trying to save it as favicon.heic. All right. <clears throat> So you know what I'm going to do, just to keep it simple? I'm not even going to save it. I'm just going to leave the original Favicon that I had in there. But it's going to be very small is what I'm telling you. All right, now, it looked like this before. You can see there's some white space there. All right, there probably still will be. I don't need this anymore, so I can close it. If you're going to do that, link to a free Favicon generator if you're going to create your own. All right, so let's see. Um, I've got that in there now. You saw it right here. I'm going to save. I'm not running in the editor we were in. I'm running in a oh, crummier editor, but it's easier for you to see stuff. So now I'm going to bring it up again. And there's my puppies. So it is there. Now it's there by the other one too, even though I didn't add it because that's the old favicon. And it looks like it's still working. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab with that open, I'm going to grab these two lines copy them to the clipboard, open up my contact.html, and put that in there instead. I'm going to replace that one line with those two lines. Okay, so now they're the same. Now, I, I am working right now with just the index.html file. <clears throat> okay, let's continue on then. So that was Favicon. Again, rather than talking about it, I showed you how to make one. All right, and I showed you how to how to create one. You should always put the favicon in the head section. Don't put it in your images. You just put it there. I can't. This is one of those things I can't exactly tell you why. It's just that's the way that it is. All right. You'll notice in their title element, theirs is really long. All right. One reason that people sometimes make that title a little longer is I believe when you um, let's see if it says it here. The title is the name of a favorite or if you bookmark the page. So mine will be Puppy's Home, whereas this is a lot more explicit. But you won't see all of it up here where you see all of mine. You should limit the length to about 65 characters. All right, that's about it. We just talked about Favicon. So. Now, first day of class, I very quickly went over what some of the stuff in here was. I talked about this metadata. And I said this first thing that's here, this mentions that we're going to be using the Unicode character set. By default, the way it used to be in the olden days, you know, back in the 90s or so, we used for our character set, we used ASCII, which is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. That only had 255 characters available to it, which were all your keyboard characters and then some characters that were not on your keyboard. And it worked fine 
as long as we were a national society, but once we started to become an international society, as we are now, it no longer worked because it didn't handle other languages. So the character set was changed, and it was changed from ASCII to Unicode. The first 256 characters of the Unicode character set all right, are the old ASCII character set. But whereas ASCII only allowed for 256 characters, I believe the last time I looked, the Unicode offers over 100,000. So it handles every language that currently exists. So this says we're using the universal transformation format 8-bit character code. In other words, we're using Unicode. This is a hack, for lack of better words, all right, that says, hey, basically, if you're using an older version of Internet Explorer, and some people still are, treat it as though you're using Edge. This is our viewport tag. The viewport is whatever mechanism you're currently using to look at the web page. All right, and we're telling it here to use the entire width by default and to scale it to 100%. Now, there are other meta tags that you could add, and a couple of them are shown here. We've already looked at the char set, so I'm not going to talk about it. All right, but that said, and I don't know if that was green or if I made it green. I guess it is just green. All right. So I talked about the char set already, and there's a little bit more in there. This name equal description, notice name equal description and name equal keywords. It's a special type of metadata. The description, all right, is used by some search engines to give a description of the site. This usually will be what appears on your search page. Not always, though. And this is the content. So these are some keywords that go along with it. Now, be leery of a couple things. First of all, other than Yahoo, most search engines, it, the claim is at least, no longer use meta tags when they're figuring out search engine optimization. So that's the first thing. Yahoo supposedly still does. But is that true or not? We don't know because companies like Bing and like Google do not share what they show for their search engine optimization algorithms. All right. Second thing, when when you put stuff like this in your site, what happens is when you submit your site to Bing and or you submit your site to Google, what happens is they have a program that goes through most of your website. It's what's called spidering your website. And it goes through, and if you've got a content in there, it looks to make sure that that content is actually what's shown for the description and for the keywords. And be real leery. I mentioned this in class yesterday that, for example, for the keywords, there were, there were people, I saw this online, that after the 9-11 tragedy about 20 years ago, that what people did was they put 9-11 in here under keywords. You know, and, and for, for instance, the example I showed yesterday, sporting goods store, what would that have to do with it? Nothing. All right, so this should, these should be honest representations, a description of what the site's about, and a description of some of the keywords. All right, you can read the, the intricacies of the stuff that's in here. Now, it says the char set is required for HTML5 validation. We could have taken that out and looked, but you can do that yourselves if you want to. All right, how to code headings and paragraphs. Now, we've looked at these already. We already looked at these H1 through H6. All right, the, the smaller the number, the bigger the heading. But you can change that. You can change that with CSS. For, if for some reason you wanted to do this, you could make your H1s, H2, H3, et cetera, all of them the same size. That might be a little confusing to a user, not an end user, but to a programmer, but you could do that. You should only have one H1 tag on a page. It should be at or near the top, and it should give kind of an explanation of what the page is all about, like we've got here. So the author says here, use heading tags to show the structure and importance of the content on the page. Only one H1 tag on a page, but put one in. Typically, people do. <clears throat> Don't use these heading levels as a way to size text. It makes no sense to do that. It's, mu it's actually easier to do it with CSS. Block elements. Now, believe it or not, you already know what a block element is. So when I come out here again and we look at this, Let's take this H1 tag that says, welcome to my website. Let's grab that tag. Let's go into the CSS 
And for our H1, well, we do have this in here. Body, background, we, all that stuff is there, but it didn't show. So let's see why it didn't show. It's H2 CSS. Rel, style sheet, CSS, styles. Styles, it's not showing. Now, why wouldn't that be showing? All right, rel equals style sheet, href equals, let's try taking that slash out of there. I put it in yesterday, and you should be able to, but if for some reason it's not working, I want it to work. So let's go back again to here, and refresh. There, it's back. Now, the h1 tag is, is an example of a block level tag. By default, which means unless told otherwise, by default, a block level tag like an h1 attempts to use the entire width the entire width of our viewport area all right our screen in this case of our laptops now you can change that but this is the way it is by default you'll notice that even if i shorten the length it still attempts to use all of it except for a little padding that we have that the, the browser puts in by itself just to show you if i didn't want that padding and i did not show this in class yesterday but if I came in here, and, and oft times people do this, you're going to see this soon. They put in what's called a reset. And there's different ways of doing a reset. I'm going to put in a real easy reset here. And it's going to say margin. I want none when I begin. Padding. I want none when I begin. So if I do that and save, note how that, well, I thought that would change. There it is. See that? Now it's taking up 100%. Everything looks much more squished together because I removed all the margin and all the padding that the browser puts in by default. Now, if you say, well, I don't want that, that's fine. We are going to do that so we can put in our own stuff. But for now, when you put in comments in a CSS file, they start with slash, forward slash, and a star, and they end with star slash, so just the opposite. I'm going to save. And notice that when I refresh again, now my default padding and margin are back, so it looks a little bit nicer. The point, though, is there are many H1 tags, and this is one of them by default again. And H1, I'm sorry, there are many block level tags, and the H1 tag is an example of a block level tag. And as they say, they're the main building blocks of a website. Each one of them begins on a new line and takes up as much room as it possibly can. All right, special blocks of text. Showed you this probably earlier, but I'm going to show it to you again now. And that is, you've seen this already. If I put in a new paragraph here, and I'm going to remove this paragraph in just a minute. So I'm going to put it up near the top here. And I'm going to have it say, hi, how you doing? And you'll know, remember, if I say hi, how you doing even though i put this over four lines and i save it it does not appear like that on my page all right rather there it is hi how you doing because the browser eats up all white space and converts it into a single character if i want that to appear like this then what i typically do is i use what are called pre-tags which means my text has been pre-formatted Once I do that, and I saved, and I refresh the browser, now you notice it is over four lines. All right? Okay. Block quote and address, I didn't show them yesterday. Let's put them in just so you see them. In fact, let's grab the block quote. Hopefully, I can copy this that they have right there. So I'm going to... Oh, they've changed this. I used to be able to copy from here. Great. Well, maybe I can copy it like this. Nope. No. Okay. So, I'll just put in put this in. All right. So, I'll put a paragraph in here, and it'll say, get rid of all that. Your AWD 1000 
instructor instructor says and then we'll come in we'll put in a block quote you let's emphasize this word will enjoy this class okay so i didn't do this in class the other day but i'm doing it now i put in a paragraph and now i put in a block quote so let's see what that looks like in or on our page well, there it is your instructor says you will enjoy this class you can see how it actually took this and indented it all right we'll leave that there for a minute let's put in an address tag and we will put it in like this so we'll put it over here rankin technical college 751 par road wentzville missouri 63385 i will save this go back to my page refresh and there it is and you'll notice since i didn't put in br tags it did take it and italicized it but i've got to I guess manually put these in so br br and let's even put one in at the end br br is a line break tag it has no beginning it is permissible to put it like this but that's considered old school and you very rarely see it you shouldn't see it in any more new developments so we've got that i have saved so notice how this will change right here when i refresh it's now over three lines so it automatically italicizes it this is a new tag a new html5 tag all right <clears throat> let's continue on again you can read this at your leisure if you so desire <clears throat> so how to do, identify inline elements now an inline element like an inline element like all right um unlike a block element an inline element does not start on a new line now you don't have to do it like this and i'm going to show it a, a little differently that's in the book but where it says you will enjoy this let's assume that this word will i wanted that to be big so i'm going to put a span tag here so i'm going to type in span whoops try it again come on put your fingers in the right place span all right and i'm going to say style equal font size for rem all right and there's that and then let's end the span tag now it's a little hard to read like this so i'm going to move this onto its own line just going to put the span on its own line here all right and then we'll move the rest of it down to the bottom what this says in here what should happen if we did it right is when it hits this word span is going to allow us it's, it is a block level tag it's going to say that i want to style this word will and i want to make it real big we did this in class the other day when i showed you like a i think we did hello there and i made the h really big now hopefully at least the word will will be really big so let's check there it is you will enjoy this class now you can look it up i did this in front of the class yesterday but you can look up html block level elements and you can get a listing of them there they are all right there they are there or you can go out again it's from w3 schools so there's your block level elements <clears throat> And there are your inline elements. Much better listing than what I showed in class yesterday. I used a different website. But these mean there will be, basically they will take up, okay, they will, they start on a new line, they take up the full width, and they have top and bottom margin with them all automatically. 
Inline elements are typically inside of block level elements. They don't start on a new line. They only take up as much room as they need. All right, let's continue on then. <clears throat> so these were some of the inline elements. All right, and again, this is what we've talked about so far. All right, character entities. Again, I probably should have come out here yesterday and just typed in W3Schools character entities. <clears throat> and you'll notice, again, W3Schools will have somewhere in here. Now, notice it says a couple things. First, it says some useful entities, which means this is not an exhaustive list. Second, and I did not, I did not mention this in class yesterday. When you put these in, I showed it like this, using the entity name, because to me that's much more self-descriptive. You can also use the number that's associated with it if you so desire. All right, so you can use either ampersand NBSP semicolon for a non-breaking space, or you can use ampersand pound sign 160 semicolon. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show you the same thing that I showed the class yesterday, but I'm going to show it a little better than I did yesterday. So I'm going to remove this. Um, your instructor says you will enjoy the class and the address tag. And I'm going to put in something that we actually don't go over for several chapters yet, but I just want you to see it. I'm going to put in a real, real simple form. All right. I'm not going to put a lot of the stuff in there that you could put in. So this will be a label. All right, it's going to have two fields in it and then a button. <clears throat> I'm purposely making this as simple as I can because I don't want to worry about things like formatting, etc. All right. What is it? Uh, we'll just use this input type equals submit. equal submit I think I've got everything correct in there so we'll see right now Oops. Let's, see. let's save that and let's go back to here and refresh there's our very simple form all right and I really should put another line in here and I will do that just so it looks a little bit nicer. So let's put in, and we'll even put another two in there. So this should look now a little bit nicer. So there's our form. It's not going to go anywhere when we submit it. But what I want to show you is this. If you ever submit a form, and I've tried doing this already. You know, if this was, for example, first name, I'd put in my first name. If this was last name, I'd put in my last name. All right, but if I if I come in here and try to put in something like this, script, <clears throat> and I say alert, hello. If I am able to put that in, and I need an ending script tag too. If I'm able to put that in, and I submit this, and I get a, uh, an alert box that comes up that says hello, that means that basically this form is unbelievably insecure. That means I can put JavaScript in the form and, and execute it. All right. So typically, one of the ways that this is used, all right, is when I go through and actually parse that input. Let me bring that back. Sorry. When I parse that input, what I will do is I will take that input that you see right there, and I don't want to go through it because it's more JavaScript-ish, but I'm going to change this 
So instead of looking like this, I'm going to use the character entities. And if I change it, let's see. No, nope, I don't need this here. Let's see, script. So this is going to become script ampersand GT. All right, then alert. That's, that's what we want, an LT and a GT. This is not executable. I have replaced this, every instance of this tag with this tag. In every instance of this tag with this tag, both here and here. That's quite often how you use character entities. Also, on the bottom here, I used a character entity of ampersand copy to put in the copyright symbol. All right, so those are the ways typically most often you use them. And they'll show some of the same examples in here. All right, there are other ones that you can use as well. There may be some here that were not shown in W3 schools or vice versa, probably more vice versa. All right, coding the core attributes. In the next chapter, we're going to begin an extensive discussion of CSS, cascading style sheets. And in there, we will talk quite a bit about IDs. The key thing about an ID is it says it's a unique identifier on a page. So if I come through here and I say, ID equal email, like we have right here. On this whole page, there should be only one ID of email. On the other hand, if you use a class, classes can be used all over the place. So notice we have a class called first that we're using on this paragraph, and another one called first. These are actually two different classes, one called first and one called field, but we're using this same class on two different paragraphs. We could also, if we wanted to, use it on our H1 by just adding in here, class equal first. So the, the, the bottom line is you want to make sure you have only one unique. The IDs on every page should be unique. You can have 50 of them, but they should be 50 different IDs. And classes don't have to be unique. That's why you create classes. There are some developers who very rarely use IDs. They use classes for just about everything. I think it's more advantageous to use IDs and classes. You'll see why starting in the lecture on um, Wednesday, today. All right, we'll look at it in more depth and breadth of coverage. All right. So how to structure the content. This is the key thing. These are your new HTML5 semantic elements. And again, I did not do this yesterday. But I really should have gone to W3 schools and said HTML5 semantic, we can say tags, we can say elements, it doesn't really matter. But there's a much bigger description of each one of these. And they break them down and give you examples of each one. So here's a way that it's oft times used. You've got a header. Now that header may be something just, for example, we could put rank and technical college up here and then have our navigation. Sometimes the header includes both the header and the navigation area. Then we've got a section. And underneath that, we've got an article. And then this is an aside. Now, if you don't know what those mean, don't really worry about them right now. It's a way of laying out a web page. We're going to get into it with more examples of this in later chapters. My goal right now is to not overwhelm you and deluge you with too much information. And just as you have a header at the top of the page, you typically have a footer at the bottom. What's confusing, and I mentioned this in class yesterday, is you can put a header, I can put a header in my section area and, a, and or a footer. Same with the article, same with the aside. I even could in my nav, which wouldn't make much sense, but I could do it if I had a reason for doing so. But it used to be that rather than structuring things like header, main, footer, people would have a div in here with an ID of header, a div with an ID of main, and a div with an ID of footer. So what's the advantage? Well, the browser can, can hook on to the semantic meaning of these things when you use the HTML5 tags, 
so it knows what a header is basically. But to just put a div in there, be, just because of the fact that you put in an ID, doesn't mean diddly. All right, so that's why they're used. And it says in here, use the HTML5 semantic elements to indicate page structure. All right, you should use them to structure the contents of a web page. They're all block elements that can contain other block elements and or inline elements. And they're supported by all modern browsers. I did mention yesterday, if you want to know if something is supported, you can go to can I use, all lowercase is fine, dot com. You can put in whatever element you're looking for. So, for instance, there's an element called transform. I can put that in, and you can see that older versions of IDE do not support it. Older versions of Firefox and Opera do not support it. Not supported at all in Opera Mini, and everyone else provides full support for it. All right. And here are some of the other elements. I did use this one yesterday. I used the figure in the fake caption. So taking a quick look at that one. Where is that picture? Come on, there it is. So I took my image. This used to be just one tag. Just the image tag. But we put a figure tag with it, which delineates that what follows is a figure. We also included a fake caption. And I put in some CSS that took that fig caption and center aligned it. All right. And I, I wanted to show you that yesterday. I, I should remember this, but for some reason it's not registering with me. So how to center align an image in CSS. All right. We want the display block. Okay. So let's put this in. I'm going to just literally grab all of this code right here. All right. And I'm going to come in here and do this. I'm going to change my image. I'm going to remove it from where it currently is. So this says I want to display this block. That's why it didn't work before. All right. So I don't need the image there. I want margin left auto and margin right auto, which means center them on the left and the right. And the width, I want it to be 50%. That I don't even really need to do. This should work just fine like this. So let's see if now our puppy is centered, and it should be centered with this. There it is. All right. Okay. We're just about through, I believe, with the chapter, but let's finish this up. There's some other things in here, and we'll go over a lot of these as we go on. All right, as it says, there's even other semantic elements. All right, div and span. Okay, when to know what, when to use what. A div is a division. It's still used a lot. Again, there's one where we didn't put in a header section. We didn't put in a main or a footer section. That's old school, but you still use see divs all over the place. It makes it much easier for you to divide a, div a document up rather into different sections or divisions, which is what div stands for. And you oftentimes even have a div within a div and you might nest them three, four or five levels deep. There may be a very good reason for doing that. As they say here, before HTML5, divs were used to define divisions within a body. Now, when possible, you should use the semantic elements. But divs are still used. Divs are block level elements. Spans are inline elements. So spans typically appear inside of divs. All right. Absolute and relative URLs. If a URL starts with either HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTPS, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or FTP, which is File Transfer Protocol. So if it starts with one of those, and it you know basically goes all the way, the whole gamut here, that's an absolute URL. You can also use what are called root relative paths. The slash here, and you saw that in the example I gave earlier, is root level. So it's from the root of the document that says that's where this document is. This says from the root, Go to images and you'll find logo.gif.
all right you can also navigate up and down dot dot slash means go up a level in the path dot slash means the current level in the path and if you have to go up two levels it'd be dot dot slash dot dot slash all right do you have to know that well it's a good thing to know will we deal with it yes will we deal with it extensively no all right coding with links i've already shown you this but let's take a look one more time at it so we can review it all right let's see all right so let's just come back to our site here and go to our index page In fact, let's go to the contact page because we don't have really anything in there other than the h1 so let's say um I don't know if there even is a puppies.com, but we're going to find out right now. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to put in a paragraph tag. Let me end it. So I'm going to say, please see our website for more information. Now, right now, there's no tag in there whatsoever. All right. So I'm going to come back to here and to here. I'm going to refresh and I'm going to go to the contact page. And you'll notice, please see our website for more information. I'm going to leave that white. I don't care right now about the CSS. All right. But let's just see, because I have absolutely no idea. Is there a puppies.com? And wow, there is a puppyfine.com. Okay. So we'll just use that one. How's that? So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to, where it says, please see our website. I'm going to put these on, on their own line so you can see them. So I'm going to put an A tag here, which is anchor. href for hypertext reference equals. And then I'm going to put that in. That's that puppy find. All right. And I will put that in here. And I will put in my ending A tag, which ends the anchor tag. So how did that change things? Now it says, please see our website. Notice if I click, it brings up the puppyfind.com. Now, what I did was bad netiquette because I should open that in its own link. So I should come in here and say, target equals underscore blank, like that. And now when I come in, let me refresh and open this, it keeps up my website. See that? So let me prove that to you. So now there's no puppies. I'm going to remove that puppy find. It's not in here. So there's my puppies contact page. When I click on this, I still have my puppies contact page, and there's my puppy find. All right? For now, at least, that's, that's the gist of what you need to know about linking. All right? And I showed you how to link to another site. I'm going to show you later how you can link to within your own site, even to within your own page. That's a coming up a little later in the, in the book. Lists, there's two basic types of lists. And what matters here, <clears throat> I'm going to put in here um, another paragraph tag. And I'm going to put in here recipe ingredients. All right, so let's assume that we're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right, you with me? Hopefully you are. So the ingredients, peanut butter, jelly, your favorite bread. So let's take a look at those. You'll notice that by default, what you get in here are these are referred to as a disk. Disk. All right. And if I want to, because I did not show this in class, but I'll show it right now. And I'm going to come in here. Hopefully I'm doing it right. We're going to find out real quick. But I'm going to put in here for my LIs. I want my list 
style type to be a square. Let's see if I use the right one. If I didn't, I'll have to look it up. I did not. All right. Let's say it's list style type. List style. Oh, it's the UL I put it on. Okay, we'll try that again. Add the right thing, but the wrong thing there. So UL. All right. And let's take a look at it again and see if I fixed it. Still did not. Did I save? I did save. I think it's just list style and not list style type. And I wonder if it is actually on the U on the LI. So list style, and I put here square. Well, this is embarrassing, but we'll f we'll figure it out. <clears throat> UL list it is list style type. Okay, so let's grab all of these, and I'm only going to include what I need. So list style type square save so let's see if that fixed it well these are not cha oh you know why they're not changing because in this file in the contact file oh, I do I have that slash in there so it was correct probably from the get-go there now they're Notice that in here and in here, they're now squares. I changed all of them. All right. The other things that I can change them to, if I don't want them to be a square, I can make them a circle. And you'll notice that it's a circle, but it's not colored in, so to speak. Or I can make this the default, which is a disk. All right, and in a later chapter, we'll talk about even other ways that you can do this. All right, so that's for the UL. All right, and in just a second, I'm going to put in something for the OL. Okay, now <clears throat> we did come in here. Sorry about that little interlude. All right, and we put in the recipe ingredients. Now we're going to put in another <clears throat> how to make a <clears throat> PB and J <clears throat> sandwich. Now, when you work with ordered list, which work basically the same way as an unordered list, except you use an OL tag instead of a UL tag. All right, number one. Get out bread. <clears throat> Two. Put peanut butter on one piece of bread. Next. Put jelly on other piece of bread. And then finally, cut sandwich in half and then eat and enjoy. And you'll notice with this, <clears throat> there is an order to it. So when I look at this one, you'll notice that they're numbered. The order matters because if I did eat and enjoy first, there'd be nothing for me to eat and enjoy. I've got to get out the bread before I can put peanut butter on it, etc. I've got to get out the bread before I can cut, make the sandwich and cut it in half. Now, just like we had before, when we did this, and we did the list style type, 
Here, we can also set a list style type, but rather than disk and circle and square, we use things like alpha. Hopefully that one's right. No, there's, there's an uppercase alpha, and it might even be upper alpha. So what is it? List style types for ordered lists. <clears throat> All right. So there it is. So notice I, it's upper and lower. Okay. So I can say upper alpha, and you'll notice now it will work. So notice how these change. There are now uppercase letters. I can change that to lower alpha. And again, you'll notice it's now lowercase letters. I can change this to lower Roman. Oops, sorry. And they are then lowercase Roman numerals. I can change this to upper Roman. And now they're uppercase Roman numerals. All right. And there are a couple of other kinds if you want to go in and take a look at them. All right. Hopefully you you know you, you get the gist. So again, when you are working, when you are working with an ordered list, there has to be some order to it. So the order matters. With an unordered list, the order does not matter. All right. Images, we put this in before, but let's put it in again anyway. There are actually more images types than this. JPEG is dot, either a dot .jpeg or a dot .jpj. Joint Photographic Experts Group. GIFs are for typically, you know, things like logos, where the, you know, it, they, they kind of look homemade for lack of better words. Graphic Interchange Format and Pings is Portable Network Graphic. There's also WebP today, which is Google's type of image. So I brought in that puppy, but let's just bring in one more image so we can see it. So let's do this. Um, I will go out again to images.google.com, and I will again put in puppies. But let's grab a different image this time. So let's grab, grab that one before. Let's grab this one. So I'm going to, and let's do it a different way. Let's copy the link address and see if we can get it to work like that. So this way we don't have to actually bring this in. All right. So I'm going to come back to here. We'll go back to our main page. All right. And I'm going to do it the same way I did it before. Figure. Image. Now this is going to look a lot different. All right. I'm going to put the alt on its own line. Another puppy. All right. Um, let's see. And we'll put in a fig caption. Another puppy picture. And we'll end our figure tag. Now, I'm not done because I've got to put this in here, but I used an address, so I told it to go out to the internet and find it. Sometimes this can work a little in a, a hinky kind of way. Let's see if that one worked. All right, I've got to go back to my main page. Doesn't look like it's there, but I've got to refresh. So notice another puppy, it didn't like that. All right, and it can be for a wide variety of reasons. You see how long that is. All right. So what I'll do, instead of doing that, I'll make it look like the other one. All right. And I will come back out to where we just were in Google Images. I will right mouse click on this and do a Save Image As. Go back to my Website 2 folder, my Images folder. Right now I've got Puppy. I'm just going to call it Puppy2.jpg. All right, so I now have that in there. So I can now change this to source equal images slash puppy2.jpg. And remember, we always put in an alt tag for two reasons. 
All right. We put in an alt tag. So if, if the system does not find our file, it'll show the tag instead. Plus, it will show this tag to, um, to anyone. All right. It'll show this tag to anyone, for example, that has a browser for the blind. So let's see if that fixed it. All right, now we've got our pictures. Okay. All right, and since we told these images to be block level, instead of having the images be inline, all right, so if I, I'm going to just show you this quickly, and that is I'm going to change these. In my CSS, for the image, I'm not going to have any of this in here, the display, block, etc. I'm going to remove all this. There's a reason or a method to my madness, and that is to show you. Oh, I'm surprised. I, maybe it's because of the fake caption. Let me try to remove that too. All right. So we will get. We will remove this for the fake caption as well. All right. In fact, I'm going to just totally remove these figure tags. I'm going to comment them out for now. I just, there's a, again, there's a reason that I'm doing this, and that is that I want to show you that these are inline elements by default. Now, if I, if I did it right, these should now be appearing on the same line, so to speak. And you notice they are. Again, that's saying that by default, which means unless told otherwise, images are inline elements, which means we'll put as many on the line as we possibly can. They don't appear on their own line. When we went in and changed the display to block, then it changed. All right, we're just about finished here. Yeah, there's the structured page. You can take a look at that. So I'm going to go back and do a little bit of a review when we start today. And after I do, and we'll jump right in as soon as I can find it to chapter four, talk about more CSS in more depth and breadth of coverage. All right, be back with that in a little bit.